13th century, the optical telegraph made it possible to send coded messages. The average distance between the telegraph stations was around 10 kilometers, but could be up to three times that across waters. Samuel Morse was originally an American artist who was to become famous for his electric alphabet. In 1835, he presented the world's first commercial telegraph. For this new device, he developed the Morse code based on short and long signals. It survived by far the primitive equipment it was designed for and is still used today, both commercially and by radio amateurs. At the end of the 19th century, Italian inventor Guglielmo Marconi invented wireless signaling. By 1901, he'd managed to transmit a Morse-coded wireless message across the Atlantic, from Poldhu in Cornwall, UK, to St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. A real breakthrough in radio came in 1906, when Lee de Forest invented the triode, the first radio tube that could be used as an amplifier. This was the first step of modern electronics. At sea, the introduction of modern radio equipment on an increasing number of vessels meant that safety increased. At the same time, a new message was learnt. Three short signals, three long signals, and finally three short signals again, SOS save our souls. When the Titanic sank in 1912, it was the first naval disaster where wireless telegraphy and the SOS played an important role in saving lives. Although over 1,500 persons lost their lives, over 700 were saved by assisting vessels who picked up the Titanic's SOS signals over the radio. Now, wait a minute, Fred. If you'll With the invention of radio came the first public radio stations. A wireless at home became the highest fashion. The family would sit together to hear news and entertainment. And right from the start, people were experimenting with radios in the car. They worked, but perhaps the antenna was a bit bulky. During the two world wars, the need for wireless communication, both for the fighting forces and secret agents, led to the rapid development of smaller and more efficient equipment. In the early 1940s, we learnt a new word, walkie-talkie, the predecessor to the mobile phone. Millions of times every day in America, a voice on a wire briefly and simply identifies itself in two words, long distance. It suggests naturally a watchful feminine presence at a switchboard and a supplementary agency that in a few seconds can select from countless routes the one that best can take this speech to faraway places. two words, long distance, represent more than the activities of switching and routing. They refer, first of all, to the routes themselves. These routes are special ones, supplied with equipment to make far speaking possible, however great the distance. Many of them provide direct wires for communication between busy centers as modern substitutes for switching interruptions of an older day. By connection with the local systems of every area in the land, they form the unified network that pulses with the flow of talk, expressing the activities of industry, agriculture, government, and the home life of the nation.
and it is the story of still other pioneers whose enterprise and genius met the human need for links that would bind together men and families and communities, though a continent was between. And so a land was peopled, so a scattered society became a homogeneous one, as obstacles to the interchange of intelligence and ideas were conquered. And so did builders, engineers, and scientists give new meaning to a word that once meant months, but now means seconds, that once meant isolation, but now means unity, to that arresting and significant word, transcontinental. By the standards of today, 1968 was a medieval time of communication technology. Typewriters, not word processors, pounded out letters. Most telephones used rotary dials. Black and white television was as common as color. The height of high tech was the lunar module, which had less computing power than today's personal computer. 1968 also was the year Larry Roberts sought out the engineers to build the Advance Research Projects Agency's computer network, the ARPANET, the acorn that would grow to become the mighty Internet. It was going to be based on special-purpose mini-computers called Interface Message Processors, or IMPs, and a revolutionary technology called packet switching. In April 1971, the ARPANET had 18 mainframe computers hooked into the network. Bob Metcalf was a grad student who connected MIT's... In October 1972, ARPA turned science fiction into science fact when it demonstrated the computer network in Washington, D.C. But unlike flying saucers, this idea really did... The Internet is the defining technology of our time, an historic revolution in communications for the human race that is changing the world. Well, the Internet is the next big thing. It is on a par with the wheel and fire and language and the printing press. The Internet enables millions of people with personal computers to communicate and connect. It's email. You've got mail. It's newsgroups and chat rooms. It's also the world's largest marketplace and shopping mall. And it's a link to websites the world over with information for every aspect of life and even the life after. This is, in fact, the telecommunications infrastructure for the 21st century. But where did the Internet come from? How did it get started? And who built this essential tool and playful toy to millions? And where is it going?